Syntax in Python is simple and easy to read and understand. And by syntax, we mean a set of rules that define how to write a correct Python program. It includes rules for naming variables, using punctuation, formatting code, defining methods, etc. We will cover the fundamental ones in this section. Comments Comments are lines of text that are ignored by the Python interpreter. We use comments to explain what the code is doing. In Python, comments begin with a hash sign, like this one. We also can use three codes in a single or double sign code to make a multi-line comment, like this one. Indentation in Python, indentation is used to indicate the block structure of the program and is crucial to the proper execution of the code. Unlike many other programming languages which use curly braces or other symbols to indicate the beginning and end of a block of code, Python uses indentation levels. In Python, each block of code that is logically grouped together, such as a loop or function or if a statement, is indented by an additional level. The amount of indentation is usually four spaces, but it can also be a tab. Here is an example of indentation in if block statements. Variables are used to store data or values in a Python program. You can use variables to store numbers, strings, and other data types. To declare a variable, you simply use the assignment operator and assign a value to a variable name. For example, to declare a variable named x and assign it the value of 5, you would use the following code, x equals 5. Here are some more examples, age equals 25, children equals 4, grades equals to the list of 78, 94, 66. You can name variables with more than one word. In that case, it's recommended to separate words with an underscore. This naming convention makes your code more readable. For example, first name equals to, for example, Ava. Operators and expressions. Operators are used to perform operations on values and variables. For example, the plus sign is used to add two numbers together and the asterisk sign is to use multiply them. For example, to increase the variable age above and store it in a new variable name new age, we use two operators, an addition operator and an assignment operator. Let's see different types of operators in Python. Arithmetic operators like plus, minus, multiply, divide that perform mathematical operations as we saw the example for the addition. And here are more examples. Note that we can also use plus operator to concat strings together, like this one. Comparison operators like greater than, less than, equals, and so on, that compare two operands and return a boolean value, which is true or false, based on the comparison. For example, age equals to 20, or x greater than or equals to 1. Logical operators including AND, OR, and NOT that perform logical operations and return a boolean value based on the evaluation of one or more conditions. For example, age greater than 18 and age less than equals to 20. Or children greater than 1 and children less than 5, which can be simplified as children between 1 and 5. Assignment operators including equal, plus equal, minus equal, and so on, that first does a mathematical operation such as plus and then assigns the new value to the variable. For example, if we have a variable named factor equals to 2, then we can have factor multiply equals to 2. And this equals to factor equals to factor times 2. Or another example, h plus equals 1. We can apply equal plus operator to strings as well. Here is an example. Message equals to hello and message plus equals world. Membership operators including in and not in that check if a value is a member of a sequence like list, tuple, set, dictionary, string, etc. For example, we can check if 3 is in the list of 1, 2, 3, and 4. Or as another example, if we have a variable ch equals to z, we can check if 
CH is not in a list of A, B, and C. Data types. Python supports several data types, including integers, floats, strings, booleans, and lists, and so on. An integer is a whole number without a decimal, for example, 5, 21, and so on. A float number is a number with a decimal point, like 3.14 or 26.001. A boolean variable is used to keep a true or false value. For example, flag equals true or is digit equals false. And a string is a sequence of characters that we put inside a pair of single quotation mark or double quotation mark. For example, ABC inside double quotation mark or this one inside single quotation mark. Lists are used to store multiple values in a single variable. For example, the list of 1, 2, 3, and 4 or the list of these words, this is a list. In Python, list items can be from different types. For example, they can be from string, integer, float, like this example. I cover lists along with tuples, sets, and dictionary in more detail in a future lecture. Python has many built-in functions that can be used without the need to import any additional modules. Here are a few examples. Print method, which is used to output text or variables to the console. Input, which is used to get input from user. Len is used to get the length of a string or the number of items in a list or tuple. Type is used to get the type of a variable. Min is used to get the minimum value in a list or tuple. Round is used to round a number to a specific number of decimal places. Sum is used to add all the elements in a list or tuple. Let's see some examples. For these examples, I use Python console. For example, to get input from the user, I want to get a name from a user. So the syntax is that I call the input function with a message and it will return what the user types in. So the name John is assigned to the name variable. Now I can call print function to print a message hello John. We can pass several arguments to print functions separated by comma, like print how comma r comma u. The output is a sentence like how are you? Can we use a separate print function for each word? Like print how, print r, print u? Let's see. The print function prints each word on a separate line by default. That means it puts a new line character at the end of each word. We can change this behavior by adding an end argument to the function with the value of blank space. It is like this one. That way we tell the print function to place a space at the end of the word instead of a new line. We can call functions with their argument coming directly from the output of another function. It is like this, print type of name. Here the output of type function is passed to the print function. And here is another example. Number is a list of integers and float, and I want to print the type of the max of the number. And it returns float as the type of 6.4. Here the output of the max function is passed to the type function, and the output of type function is passed to the print function. We can check it with the min function 2 and see it shows int as type of the number 2. Run Python code. To run your Python program in the command prompt, type in Python and then your Python file. Note that you need to be inside the folder that contains your file. The other option is that you can run through your ID. For example, if you have PyCharm like me, there is a green triangle button to run the code, like this one. You also can use the terminal window in the IDE to run the code. And this is the terminal in PyCharm. Another convention we use in Python programs is that inside the Python file, we can check if the module name is set to underscore main, like this one. This is used when we want our Python file to be run as a standalone application instead of being used in another Python file. We will see examples in the future lectures. An if statement is used to check if a certain condition is true. If the condition is true, the code inside the if statement will be executed. If the condition is false, the code inside the if statement will be skipped. This is the way Python handles the decision flow. The syntax is if condition colon statement. Note that we need to indent the statements under the if condition to make it part of the if block. Let's see an example. In this example, the variable age is set to 25. The if statement checks if the value of age is greater than 18, 
since 25 is greater than 18 the code inside the if statement will be executed and age is greater than 18 will be printed what if if we want to run an alternative code if the condition is not true in that case we use else statement let's change the age value to 15 then we can have an else statement to check if age is not greater than 18. in this example if age is less than or equal to 18 the code under else statement would be printed if we want to implement more than one condition then we should use the elif statement elif is short for else if and we need to have a condition for it again let's change the age value and then add the elif statement so in this example if age is greater than 16 but less than 18 the code in elif block will be run it's important to mention here again that each block of code inside if elif and else statement should be indented with the same number of spaces or tabs otherwise we would face an indentation error loops loops are used to repeat a block of code a certain number of times python supports two types of loops the for loop and while loop for loop iterates over a sequence of items such as a list tuple or a string here is an example of a for loop that iterates over a list of numbers in this example the for loop will iterate over each item in the numbers list on the first iteration the value of number will be set to 10 the code inside the loop will be executed and 10 will be printed to the console on the second iteration the value of number will be set to 20 the code inside the loop will be executed and 20 will be printed to the console this process will continue until all items in the list have been processed we can also use built-in range function to create a sequence of numbers to iterate over for example to print the numbers from 0 to 9 using a for loop you would use the following code for i in range of 10 print i in this example the for loop will iterate 10 times with the value of i starting at 0 and ending at 9. for a while loop we need to define a statement usually a conditional statement that controls the termination condition of the loop for example to count from 0 to 9 we can write this code counter equals to 0 while counter less than 10 print the counter and increment the counter it is important to update the counter variable here so every time the while condition is evaluated the code sees the updated value of the counter coding challenge okay so far we learned a good amount of python basics here i want you to write a piece of code for this question you are supposed to write a program for a traffic speed camera on a highway at each time a list of car speeds are received by the camera for example a list of 67 64 55 70 and so on you need to write a code that decides what to do based on the following rules if speed is greater than 70 suspend the driver's license if speed is less than 70 but greater than 60 issue a ticket otherwise the car is good to go i want you to pause the video here spend two to five minutes writing your code and then check out with my solution next test your program with the list i provided here and your output for each speed should look like this one first we create the list of speeds then i create a for loop that iterates over the list inside the for body i bring in my if statement to check the speed and decide the action needed for each speed range so first print the speed then check the highest speed and action to suspend the driver's license then check for the next highest speed which is greater than 60 and issue a ticket in the else statement i print good to go when i run the program every item in the speed list get its appropriate recommendation from the camera functions in python are a way to organize and reuse code functions can have some input and do something with that input functions can also return some output to define a function in python we use the def keyword followed by the name of the function and open and a close parenthesis and a column inside the parentheses we can specify any input that the function will take also called arguments after the column the function body comes with one indentation here is an example of a simple function that adds two numbers together in this example we have defined a function called add which takes two arguments a and b 
Inside the function, we use the return keyword to return the result of adding A and B together. We then call the function by passing in the values 3 and 4 as arguments and assign the result to the variable result. Finally, we print out the value of result and we get the output 7. Functions can be used for many different tasks, from simple math operations like this one to more complex tasks like reading files or connecting to a database, rendering videos or data processing to name a few. Here is another example to define and call a function. You notice that in this example, our say hi function does not return anything. In fact, if you assign this function call to a variable like I did here hi equals say hi, you can see that the return value is none. We can rewrite that code to make it more general by passing the name as an argument. Now let's talk about function scope. When you define a variable inside a function, that variable is only available inside that function. This is called a local variable. However, if you define a variable outside of a function that is in the main body of the program, that variable is available anywhere in the program, and it is called a global variable. Here is an example of a local variable. So here, if we want to access the message variable outside of the print message function, let's say by calling print message, we get an error. The scope would be the same if we bring message as a parameter to the function. Now let's look at another example. In this example, we first define a global variable x and set it to 5. Then we define a function show2. Inside the function, we set the value of x to 2. This x is local to the function, so it is only accessible from the show2 method and is not mixed with the x we defined outside of the function. We call the function show2 and it prints 2. Then we access the global x and print it, which is 5. And here is the run. Modules in Python are predefined code functions, algorithms, and even variables and constants that we can reuse in our code. There are many built-in modules in Python. For example, if we want to get the time, we use the time module. Or to do some math computations, there is a math module. In Python, you can use the import statement to import modules and use the functions and variables defined in that module. Here is an example. In this example, we import the math module and use the pi variable defined in the module to print the value of pi. You can also use the from keyword to import specific functions or variables from a module, like this one. Here is an example from path module to split folders. Modules can also be created and used by the user. You can create your own module by creating a new Python file and you can use the functions and variables defined in that module in your Python files. Here is an example of how you can create and use a module. First, we create a new Python file, create mymodule.py. Inside that file, we create a function called myfunction that simply prints hello world. Then in another Python file, we import the mymodule and call the myfunction from that module, which result in the output hello world. And here I test my module reuse. Coding challenge. Okay, so far we learned how to write functions and organize functions in modules. Here I want you to write an application for this question. In the previous lecture, we asked to write a program that uses if, elif, and else statement in a for loop. In this challenge, you need to write another program for a traffic speed camera on a highway. A list of car speeds are sent to your program by the camera. For example, the list of 67, 64, 55, 70, and so on. The question is two parts. First, write a module, a separate Python file, with the following functions. Usage of Python built-in functions is encouraged. A function that finds the average speed in a list of speeds. A function that finds the minimum speed in a list of speeds. A function that returns a list of speeds greater than 60. Part 2. In another file, import your module and call those three functions on this list of speeds. I want you to pause the video here, spend 7 to 10 minutes writing your code and then check out with my solution. Your output should look like this one. First I created a new file my module and inside that I defined three functions get average, get mean and get speeds greater than. To get average I first get the sum of the speeds in the list, then the length of the speed 
if there is items in the list i return the sum of the list divided by the number of the list otherwise i return zero to get the minimum speed i simply call the min function from the built-in functions to get the speeds greater than 60 i define the limit 60 in the parameters then in the body of the function i define a new variable new list then iterate over the speeds if any of the speeds is greater than limit I append it to the new list and finally return the new list in the other file i import my module i define the list of the speeds then i call get average from my module call it average then i call get min function and return the value in min speed and finally call get speeds greater than function and return the values in our speeds list Data structures are a way to organize and store data in a program. They allow you to organize data in a way that is easy to access, modify, and process. In Python, we have several built-in data structures that we can use to store data. We have lists, tuples, sets, and dictionaries. Let's start by learning about lists. Lists are one of the most commonly used data structures in Python. They are used to store an ordered collection of items. You can define a list by putting a comma-separated sequence of items inside a square brackets. Here is an example of how to define a list and add items to it. In this example, we first define a list called myList and initialize it with the values 1, 2, and 3. We then use the append method to add the value 4 to the end of the list. Finally, we print out the value of my list and we get the output 1, 2, 3, and 4. Lists are very useful when you want to store multiple items and be able to access them easily. We can access list items by their index. List index start from 0. For example, here I want to get items at index 0 and index 1. To get the last item in the list, we can use minus 1 as an index. Here is an example. To get a sub list from the original list, we use list slicing. For example, to get items from index 1 to 3, we can write specifying index 1 to 4. Note that the second index in slicing is the last index we desire plus 1. Here are other slicing notations. Here, by specifying only the second index, we get the list items from the beginning up to the index 3. In this notation, we just specify the first index and we get the list item from the index 2 up to the end of the list. And here when we don't specify the index, it is equivalent to the whole list. Let's run this. So this is the sublist from the beginning up to index 3, which is equals to the original list. This is the list start from index 2 up to the end of the list. And this one is the same as the original list. We can define a multi-dimensional list as well. So each element of the matrix is a list. We can access any of the inner list by index operator. To access the third element in the second inner list, which is number 6, we use the index operator for the inner list at index 1 and then inside that use index 2. There is a short way to create a list based on another list, which is called list comprehension. Let's say we have a list of numbers. We want to get the list of even numbers from that list. The way that we create comprehension list is like this. Our first expression iterates our items in the list with a for loop and then applies if condition. Now let's print a new list which works as expected. That is equivalent to this code. Creating a new list, iterating over the original list, apply the if condition and append to the new list. Now let's review some common functions on lists. We talked about append to add one element at the end of the list. Extend adds multiple elements to a list. Index returns the first appearance of a particular value. Max that returns an item from the list with the maximum value. And Min that returns the minimum value in the list. Len returns the length of the list. Insert that adds a component at the required position. The first argument is the position and the second argument is the value. Count method that returns the number of elements with the required value. Pop that removes the element at the required position. Remove function that removes an item with the desired value. Reverse method to reverse the order of the list. 
Sort method to sort the list in ascending order. And clear method to remove all the elements from the list. Tuples are similar to lists in that they are used to store an ordered collection of items. However, unlike lists, tuples are immutable, which means you cannot add, remove, or modify items after they have been defined. Duplicate values are allowed in tuples like lists. Here is an example of how to define a tuple and access its items. In this example, we first define a tuple called MyTuple and initialize it with the values 1, 2, and 3. Note that to define tuples, we use parentheses to store items. We then use the index operator to access the second item in the tuple, which is 2. Finally, we print out the value of MyTuple1 and we get the output 2. Here is another example that we define tuple1 equals to the values of Python, Java, C, and VB. We can access tuple items by slicing. For example, tuple1 from index1 will return Java, C, and VB. We also can iterate over a tuple. Let's say we have these two tuples. We can join tuples by plus operator. Some useful functions in tuples include len function to return the number of items in a tuple, tuple.count that return the number of a specified value in a tuple, and tuple.index that return the position of a specified item. Tuples are useful when you want to store multiple items and be sure that they won't be modified. They are also useful when you want to use them as keys in a dictionary since lists are not hashable. We will see it in the next video. Sets are used to store a collection of items. Sets have some unique characteristics. They don't allow duplicate items and they are unordered, which means items in a set have no indexes. We use curly brackets to hold set items. Here is an example of how to define a set and add items to it. In this example, we first define a set called myset and initialize it with the values 1, 2, and 3. We then use the add method to add the value 4 to the set. Finally, we print out the value of my set and we get the output of 1, 2, 3, and 4. The other way to define a set is by set constructor. In this example, I pass a list to the set constructor and you see that the duplicate value 3 is removed in the set. We can iterate over set items. Given that I have a set of languages, I want to iterate and print each language. Note that the order of the items is not preserved in the set. We also can check if an item is available in a set by in operator. We may remove an item from a set by calling remove function. To union two sets, there is a union function, which union two sets in a new set. And to get the intersection of two sets, we can call intersection function. Sets are useful when you want to store unique items and perform set operations like union, intersection, and difference. Dictionaries are a powerful data structure that allows you to store items in a key value format. You can define a dictionary by putting a comma separated sequence of key value pairs inside curly braces. Here is an example of how to define a dictionary and add items to it. In this example, we first define a dictionary called MyDict and initialize it with key value pairs A1, B2, and C3. We then use the index operator to add a new key value pair D and 4 to the dictionary. Finally, we print out the value of MyDict and get the output. We can access dictionary items by their key. Duplicates are not allowed in dictionary keys. Dictionaries are changeable, meaning that we can change, add, or remove items after the dictionary has been created. Here we change the value of the item with key B. Dictionary keys can be of primitive types such as integer, float, string. We also can have tuples as keys in dictionaries, but a list cannot be set as a key in dictionaries. Here is an example that we have tuples as keys in the dictionary and how we access the items. We can get all keys and values separately. For that, we use keys method and values method. The items method will return each item in a dictionary in the form of tuples in a list. We can iterate over the dictionary in two ways. In the first one, we iterate over the keys in the dictionary. And in the second one, we iterate over key and value in the dictionary by items method. Some common functions in dictionaries include copy that returns a copy of the dictionary, 
pop that removes the element with the specified key, get that returns the value of the specified key, and it is like using index operator. Set default that returns the value of the specified key. If the key does not exist, insert the key with the specified value. Update function that updates the dictionary with the specified key value pairs. And clear function that removes all the elements from the dictionary. Remember that dictionaries are useful when you want to store items with keys and be able to access them easily. Given the materials we learned in this tutorial about sets and dictionaries along with the previous video about lists and tuples, I want you to pause the video and spend 10 to 15 minutes to implement this coding challenge and then continue the video to check out my solution. You are given this two-dimensional list of words named lines. The assignment wants to implement five tasks. First, create a dictionary and store each word and its frequency in the dictionary as key value and then print the content of the dictionary. Second, find words that have the same number of characters and frequency and return them as a list. You can use list comprehension and print them. Third, in the lines list, replace was with is and print the modified lines. Four, create another dictionary whose keys are tuples consisting of the words in line items and value is the number of words in that line and print the dictionary. And five, create a set and store unique words in the set and print the set. Your output should look like this one. Task one for word frequencies, task two for special words, task three to replace was with is, task four to have tuples as dictionary keys, and task 5 set of the unique words. To the solution first I define the lines of the words. For the first task I create an empty dictionary then iterate over each line of the lines and inside each line iterate over each word then check if the word is in the frequency dictionary or not. If it's not I add it to the frequency dictionary otherwise I will increment the frequency of that word. For the second task, first I iterate over the keys in the frequency dictionary and check if the frequency of the word is equals to the length of that word. And here is another way of doing that by creating an empty list and appending to the list. For the third task to replace was with is, I create a range index for all the sublists and inside each sublist I create another index then iterate over the words of those lists and if any of those words equals to was, we can replace it with is. For the fourth task, we create an empty dictionary and then we iterate over the items in lines. Inside the for loop, we convert the line list to tuple and assign the length of line as the value. For the fifth task, we create an empty set, then iterate over each word in each line and add those words in the line. If there are duplicate words, the set will ignore them. To define a class in Python, you use the class keyword followed by the name of the class and the column. Within the class, you can define a special method called init that is enclosed in two underscore characters. The init method is used to initialize the properties of the object when it is created. There is a special variable named self that we use as the first argument of class methods. Self refers to the object itself and is used to access the object's properties and methods. Let's take a look at this example. In this example, we define a class called dog which has two properties, name and breed. The init method is used to initialize these properties with values passed as arguments when an object of this class is created. In this case, we can create a new dog object by passing a name and a breed. Here I create an object named dog1 with the name Fido and breed golden retriever. We can add methods to the class to modify the set of the class or do some other functions. We call them instance methods because they can be called from an instance of the class. The first argument of the method should be self. Here is an example. In this example, we added method run to the class dog. So whenever we create an instance of this class, we can access the method from that instance. Let's run this code and we see the output of the method run. In addition to the init and instance method, you can also define class variables and methods. 
Class variables are variables that are shared by all instances of a class, while class methods are methods that are bound to the class and not the instance of the object. Class methods can be called by both class and object, but as we saw earlier, instance methods can only be called by objects. Let's see an example of class variable and class method. In this example, inside the class dog, we define a class variable species with the value mammal which is shared by all instances of the class. We also define a class method bark. You see that we use at sign class method decorator to specify a class method. Now let's create two instances of these classes and check the class variable and class method from these objects. So I created two objects, dog1 and dog2, then print species from dog1 and species from dog2 and species from class dog and calling the bark method from class dog. And here is the run. As you see, the class variable returned the mammal for all of the calls from objects or class and call the bark method from class itself. Now let's talk about inheritance. Inheritance is a mechanism that allows you to create a new class that inherits the properties and methods of an existing class. The new class is called a subclass and the existing class is called a superclass or parent class. This allows you to reuse existing code and avoid duplicating functionality. Here is an example based on the dog class we defined above. In this example, we create a new class Golden Retriever which inherits from the dog class. The Golden Retriever class now has all the properties and methods of the dog class and we can also add new methods specific to Golden Retriever, which is the fetch method in this example. Now let's create an instance of this class and call its functions. Calling the inherited method run and then calling the specific method fetch. As you see, we have two methods available for this instance. Run that is inherited from the super class and fetch which is specific to the golden retriever class. And let's run the code. The output of run method and the output of fetch method. Polymorphism is the ability of a function or method with the same name to work with multiple types of objects. Polymorphism let us define methods with the same name in different classes. Here is an example. In this example, we created two classes named English and Spanish. We have a function named say hello in these two classes which prints hello in their language. Then I create instances of these classes and put them in a list. We then create a for loop that iterates through a list of instances of those two languages. Inside the loop, we call the say hello method and at this point, we don't care about the type of each instance, but the name of the method we call. And here is the run of the program. In this coding challenge, you need to implement an application for a library to help manage some kinds of documents they have. Define class and subclasses to identify different types of documents. For example, books, dictionaries, magazines and add appropriate properties such as title and page count and methods such as get page count and print information to them. Then write a code that creates several instances of each class and add them to a list. Then iterate over the list items to print information and get the count of total pages of all documents. Use inheritance and polymorphism. Your output should look like this one. Here is the print information of the documents and here is the total number of the pages for all documents. Please pause the video here and spend 10 to 15 minutes to complete this coding challenge. For the solution, first I create a class named document and initialize it with properties including title, page count, and year published. I also define two methods. One is get page count that returns the page count and the other is print info that print the title, the page count and year of publication. Then I have a class named book that inherits from document and it has its specific method get summary. Then another class that inherits from document named magazine and it has its specific method update title. Another class that inherits from book which is dictionary class and it has its specific method named search. In the main body of the application, I created three instances of book, two instances of magazine, and one instance of dictionary, and add all them to a list. Then I define a variable named all page count to track the count of all the pages. Inside this for loop, I go over all documents in the list. First, I call the print info method of the documents, 
and then get page count and add the page count of each document to the all page count variable and at the end i print all page counts let's run the code and you see by calling print info we get the information of all the document types and finally the all page counts the first thing we need to do when working with files in python is to open them for the examples of this tutorial i have a file named example.txt in the current folder and here is its content here is an example of how to open a file for reading in this example, we open a file named example.txt in the read mode, which is represented by the string r. You can also open a file in write mode represented by the string w, so you would be able to write to the file or open a file in append mode represented by the string a, so you can append content to an existing file. It is important to close the file after you are done with the file to free up the system resources and prevent data loss. You can use the close method on the file object to close the file. And there is a better way to close the file instead of calling the close function. And that is by using the with open as a statement. Here is how we can use it. In this case, after the indentation inside the with open is finished, the file will be closed automatically. I will show you some examples of this syntax shortly. Once we have a file object, we can read the content of the file using the read method. This method returns the entire content of the file as a string. Here is an example. In this example, we open a file called example.txt in read mode, read the contents of the file and store it in a variable called content and print it out. Then we close the file using the close method. Let's run the code and see the content is printed. If we wanted to write this code using with open as a statement, it is like this. And let's run it again. And you see the output is exactly the same as the previous code. In addition to reading from a file, we can also write to a file. To write to a file, we open it in write mode, which is represented by the string w, or we may open it in append mode, which is represented by the string a. If a file already exists, write mode will erase the old content, but append will add to the end of the old content. Here is an example of how to write to a file. In this example, we open a file called example.txt in write mode, write a new line of text to the file using the write method, and close the file. For this example, the example.txt file already exists with this content. So let's run the code and see what happens. As you see, the new content replaced the old content in the file example.txt. Now let's append to this file. This time we open the file in append mode and append this line to the file. And let's run the code and see the result in example.txt. So as you see, the new line has been appended to the old file. Again, if we want to write the code using with open as a statement, here it is. And here we see the updated file with the new line added. Another common use case for working with files is reading and writing CSV files. CSV stands for comma separated values and it is a popular file format for storing data in a tabular format. Python provides a built-in module called CSV that makes it easy to work with CSV files. Writing to a CSV file is simple. You can use the csv.writer method to create a writer object and use the write row method to write rows to the file. Here is an example. In this example, we first import the CSV module and use the open function to open the file in write mode. We create a CSV writer object using the csv.writer method and use the write row method to write rows to the file. The file will be closed at the end of the vid block. Let's run the code and then see the file content. As you see, the example CSV file is created with this content. Now I have a CSV file ready in this folder named example.csv. Now let's see an example of how to read a CSV file. In this example, we first import the CSV module 
and use the open function to open the file in read mode. We create a CSV reader object using the csv.reader method and use a for loop to iterate through the rows in the file. Each row is returned as a list of values. Finally, the file is closed after with statement is finished. Let's run the code. As we expected, three rows in the file have been returned. Please note that the first row returned is the header of the CSV file. Now that we covered how to work with files, it is time for a coding challenge. In this coding challenge, you need to implement a function to create a CSV file in which each row consists of three columns, a number, its square, and its binary representation. Write to the CSV file for the numbers from 1 to 16. In another function, read the CSV file and print the numbers whose square is divisible by 3 or 5. In the application, call these two functions in sequence and print the output. Your output should look like this one. Please pause here and spend 5 to 10 minutes to implement this coding challenge. Then resume to check out my solution. For the solution, first I import the CSV module. Then I have created two methods, create file and read file. In the create file, first I open the example.csv file in the write mode. I create the writer from the csv.writer method. And then I write the header, including the number, square, and binary. Then I create a for loop to go through 1 to 16. And inside the for loop, I call writer.write row and pass an array, including the number, the square of the number, and binary representation of the number. And finally, I close the file. In the read file method, I open the file in the read mode, then I create a reader using the csv.reader file method, then I create a for loop to iterate over the rows in the reader. You remember the row is the list of items that I have in each row. So the first item of the row was the number. I get that number, I compare it with the string number because I want to skip the header. So if it's not the header, then I convert that number because it is in string format to integer. Now I can check if it is divisible by 3 or 5. If that's happened, then I can print that row. And finally, I close the file. And here first I create the file and write to the file and, and then I read the file content. Now let's run the code. So as you see, I have returned the numbers that are divisible by 3 or 5. Before we dive into error handling, let's first talk about what errors and exceptions are. An error is a problem that occurs when a program is running, such as a syntax error or a semantic error. An exception is a specific kind of error that is raised when something unexpected happens, such as trying to divide by zero or trying to access an index that doesn't exist in a list. Now let's see how to handle the exceptions. The most common way to handle exceptions in Python is by using a try except block. A try block is used to enclose the code that might raise an exception, and an accept block is used to handle the raised exception. Here is a simple example. In this example, we use a try block to enclose the code that might raise an exception by executing divide 1 by 0. We then use an accept block to handle the zero division error exception that might be raised and print an error message. The zero division error is a specific type of exception. We also might use a general one such as exception. Let's run this piece of code. In addition to the try accept block, you can also use a finally block. The code in a finally block will always be executed, regardless of whether an exception was raised or not. This is useful for cleaning up resources or closing files. Here is an example. In this example, we use a try block to enclose the code that might raise an exception, which is dividing 1 by 0. We then use an accept block to handle the zero division error exception that might be raised and print an error message. 
And finally, we use the finally block to print a message that will always execute. Let's run this piece of code and see what it prints. And as you see, the print inside the try block is executed and the finally block is also executed. There are several common types of exceptions that you can use in your code, such as value error, file not found error, not implemented error, exception, and so on. So far, we have learned how to handle exceptions, but you can also raise your own exceptions. You can use the raise keyword to raise an exception. Here is an example. In this example, we define a function called divide that takes in two arguments x and y. We then check if y is equal to zero and if it is, we use the raise keyword to raise a value error exception with the message cannot divide by zero. This allows us to handle the exception in a more controlled and specific way rather than just letting the program crash. Let's run the program. As you see, our specific error message has been printed here. Another way to handle errors and exceptions in Python is by using the assert statement. An assert statement is used to check if a given condition is true and if it's not, it raises an assertion error. Here is an example. In this example, we assert that x should be greater than 0 and if it's not, we raise an assertion error with the message x should be positive. This is a useful way to check for preconditions and postconditions in your code. Now let's run the code. And as you can see, the assertion has raised here. Coding challenge. Suppose in a social media post, you ask a question like, what is your lucky number? People are commenting their number in either digit format or in words. You have a dictionary of all these response comments in string type associated with the usernames. For example, user1 commented 1, user2 commented word 2, user3 commented digit 3 and so on. Write a class that gets the dictionary as its property in the init function. Then define a function in the class to go over the dictionary, parse the numbers to integer, and identify the users whose number is divisible by 7. From the alphabetic numbers, your application only considers numbers equal to 7. Then you need to call the function in the main body of the application. I also encourage you to change the application to read the user responses from a CSV file and insert them to a dictionary. With a dictionary like this one, your output should look like this, which reports user 5 and user 6. First, I define a class, I call it my class, and inside the class, I define init function and the argument of the init function is numbers as dictionary. I assign it to self.numbers. Then I define the function check even numbers. In this function, I define an empty list, seven numbers. And then in the for loop, I go over the items in the numbers dictionary. Inside the for loop, I define try and accept block. Inside the try, I want to cast the number into integer and then divide it by seven. So if this condition is true, then I append that user to my seven numbers. For the alphabetic numbers, we get exception. And inside the exception, we check the lower characters of the number. If it equals seven, then we append that user to the seven numbers. And finally, we return the seven numbers list. And here we define the numbers as the dictionary and then define an instance of the my class and pass the numbers as the argument of the class and then call the function check even numbers and print the output and let's run it again and you see the user 5 and user 6 are those with the lucky numbers of 7. Before we can start creating plots, we need to import matplotlib library. Matplotlib is the most popular library for creating plots and charts in Python. Here is how to import it. In this example, we import the pyplot module from the matplotlib library and give it the alias name plt. Now let's create our first plot. Line plot is a common type of plot that is used to show how a single set of data changes over time. 
Here is an example of how to create a line plot. In this example, we first create two lists, x and y, that represent the x and y values of our data. Then we use the plot function from the PLT object to create a line plot of the data. Finally, we use the show function to display the data. Let's run the code. Now let's customize our line plot. We can change the title, labels, and other properties of the plot. Here is an example of how to customize the plot. Now let's run our customized plot. And as you see, we have the title and X label and Y label for our plot. So in this example, we use the title, X label, and Y label functions from the plot object to add a title, X axis label, and Y axis label to the plot respectively. Another common type of plot is a bar chart. A bar chart is used to show how different sets of data compare. Here is an example of how to create a bar chart. Let's say we have a school of five grades and the number of students in each grade. In this example, we use the bar function from the PLT object to create a bar chart of the data. And we also use the show function to display the chart. And here is the run of the code. Pie charts are a popular way to show the proportion of different categories in a dataset. Here is an example of how to create a pie chart. In this example, we first define two lists, stores and sales, that represent the store names and their sales over a period of time. Then we use the pie function from the PLT object to create a pie chart of the data. And we also use the show function to display the chart. And let's run this code. If you want to save the chart as a file, you can simply call the savefig function and pass a file location to it. For example, to save the above pie chart in a file named salespiechart.png, we can write plt.savefig with the file name. And we run the code and we see that salespiechart.png has been created. Coding challenge. In this coding challenge, we have the sales and profit data for four branches of a store. The data is represented as these three lists, branches, sales, and profit. We also have number of site visits for the last 14 days. And that site visit is represented by another list like this one. Write a program to show the pie chart of the sales, a bar chart to show the profit per store, and a line chart to show the site visits over the last two weeks. Your application should generate charts like this one. A pie chart, a bar chart, and a line chart. Solution. First, I import PyPlot from the matplotlib library and name it as PLT. Then I define four lists for my data, the list of branches, list of sales for each branch, list of profit for each branch, and the list of site visit for the last 14 days. Then I call the pie function to create a pie chart given the sales and the branches, and then calling the show to show the pie chart. For the bar chart, I call the bar function and pass the branches as the first argument and profit as the second argument, and then call the show function and for the last one to show the site visit with the line chart, I call the plot function. For the first parameter, I simply use the range function to have the range of numbers from 0 to 13. And the second argument is site visit and then plot.show. Let's run the code and see the output. The first chart is the pie chart with the labels of the branches. The second is the bar chart with profit for each of the branches. And the last one is the line chart that shows the site visit for the 13 days. Before we can start building our web application, we need to install Flask. Flask is a lightweight web framework for Python that makes it easy to create web applications. You can install it using pipe by running the following command in your terminal. This command will install Flask and all its dependencies on your system. I already have it installed, so I ignore this installation.
Now let's create our first web application. A basic web application in Flask is just a Python script that defines a few routes and their corresponding function handlers. Here is an example of how to create a basic web application. In this example, we import the Flask class from the Flask module and create an instance of the Flask class. Then we define a route using the at sign app.root decorator which maps the slash URL which is the root of the web app to the hello function. The hello function returns the string hello world which will be displayed in the browser. And finally, we run the application using the app.run. When we run the application on our machine, it starts the web app on the local host or IP address 127.0.0.1 and will use an empty port such as 8080 or 5000. We can check it by typing this address in a browser after running the app. Let's run the app. And as you see in the log, my app runs at this address 127.0.0.1 port 5000. I can click in this address and it goes to the browser and shows the hello world message. Now let's create a web app using a template. A template is a file that defines the structure of the web page and how it should be displayed. Flask will look for templates in the templates folder. So you need to create a folder with this name in your application and save that HTML template there. So I create the templates folder here. And here is an example of how to create a template. In this example, we create a basic HTML template with a title, a heading, and a placeholder for a variable named name. That means you need to have that name variable in your .py code. We can use this template to render the web page and replace the placeholder with the actual data. If you want to have some images or JavaScript for your web app, you need to create a folder named static and put those files over there. Now that we have a template, let's render it. We can use the render template function from the Flask module to render the template and pass in any variables we want to use. Here is an example of how to render the template. In this example, we import the render template function from the Flask module and use it to render the hello.html template. We also pass in a variable name with the value John Doe to be used in the template. Let's run the app. So as you see, our application picked the name variable as John Doe and show it here. Another important aspect of web development is handling GET requests. Flask makes it easy to handle GET requests using the request object. Here is an example of how to handle that. In this example, we import a request object from the Flask module. We define a route that only handles GET requests and use the request.args dictionary to access the GET data. To test, we can pass query using parameters in the URL we use to access the page. It's like this URL. Let's run the code. Since I have not provided the get parameter, it returns an error. Now let's correct the request. So I add the parameter name equals John and hit the enter and it returns hello John. If I change it to name Mehdi, it returns hello Mehdi. Coding challenge. You are given a CSV file that contains weather temperature captured of a city for three days during 24 hours. The CSV file columns are day of month, hour, and temperature. Write a web application that creates a line chart of the temperatures for every specific day, like day one, day two, and day three, and save it to a file under the static folder. Also, create a HTML template that would show the image of your plot in the page when you send the day of the month through the get request. Your CSV file named data.csv should contain three columns, day, hour, and temp, and it has 72 rows. You can generate your own data set or use this one. And your output should look like this one slash chart question mark day equals one 
shows the temperature for day one. If I change it to day two, it shows temperature for day two and day three as well. Solution. First of all, I have data.csv file in the root of my application. Then inside the web application, first I import the Flask, render template and request, and also CSV and matplotlib modules. Then create the app using the Flask class. I define a function to read data from the CSV file. I define an empty list, then open the CSV file to read the data. We have covered opening CSV files in the previous sections. Then for each row of the data in the CSV file, I append three columns to the data. Also note that we have used try except block here. So in case there is any issue in our data, we can pass those data. I use the pass keyword here. So we don't uh, break the application in case of the exception. Then I have another function create chart for each specific day. So day is passed as an argument. The purpose of this function is to filter hours and temperature for each specific day. So in that case, we have a separate hours and temperatures list for each day. And then we create a line chart based on those hours and temperatures and save the file inside the static folder. And finally, we close the plot. Here's the main part. I add the root slash chart with the get method for the chart method and inside that I get the day from the get request and call the render template function for a template I have created tempchart.html with the parameter day equals day and then inside the main application for three days I call the create chart with the parameter i which is the day so this loop create the chart for three days and save them in the static folder and then we run the application by calling the app.run and here is the template I have created and here I use the variable day and then I added an image tag the source refers to the png files that created for the charts inside the static folder so I create the static folder here to save those png files and now let's run the code pass the right parameter day one day two and day three if we go back to the static folder we should see that these three png files for the charts have been created here